that one. Okay, go live. Good morning. Welcome back to another. Good, Good morning. morning. And welcome back to at Monty Heart webinar. Today we have Dr. Jennifer Reimer with us from Duke Heart, who will be speaking about disparities and challenges in the care and treatment of patients with peripheral vascular disease. To give you some background on Dr. Reimer's um, outstanding accomplishments, she did her internal medicine residency and fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at Duke University, as well as her fellowship in interventional cardiology. And there she is a uh, young investigator for the AHA with a career development award and also some uh, funding from industry to pursue her, uh, her original investigator initiated research. We're delighted to have her here today and I give the floor to you, Dr. Reimer. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Dr. Bortnick. This is, it's wonderful to be here with you all this morning. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about an issue and um, an area that's near and dear to my heart. It's um, both my area of clinical interest and my area of research interest. And so I'm excited to get to, to talk with you all this morning. So I'll um, show my disclosures briefly here um, from industry-sponsored research. So I want to start off a little bit about why, um, why this matters to me and why this is so important. So I obviously practice at Duke Heart, um, as was mentioned, and you can see right in the middle of the state is Durham and Wake County, and that's uh, really where I'm, I'm established. Um, and this is a, a diagram and a figure showing the amputation rates in North Carolina, and, and you may know that the southeast is the PAD belt. Um, so North Carolina has higher rates of amputation, particularly in the Northeast corner of the state. And that's a lot in part due to lack of access of care to vascular specialists, to um, vascular surgeons and interventional cardiologists. So one day a week, I go up to an affiliated hospital um, in the Northeastern County and in Vance and Granville County and um, see only patients with peripheral vascular disease, do complex peripheral vascular interventions and um, take care of these patients. And, and since we have started going up there, we have been able to reduce the rates of amputation just by the presence of Duke being in this community. So this is an area that I think we can really make a lot of difference in people's lives um, in their mobility um, in their cardiovascular risk. So just to start off with there, and, interventional cardiologist that does peripheral vascular interventions. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about epidemiological disparities, um, particularly in the population of my interest in, in um, African-Americans. Um, we'll talk a little bit of, about how the disparities in the vascular workforce um, contribute some, I think, to the disparities in overall care heterogeneity and vascular care practices. I think this is a huge issue in the United States um, that's in some ways under-recognized. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about challenges and future directions for PAD research and, and what I think is on the horizon as far as focus in peripheral vascular disease. So to start off with, many of you have probably seen diagrams like this. Um, epidemiologic, racial, and ethnic disparities certainly are present in peripheral vascular disease. So in the left figure you see for men, um, rates of PAD are two times as high for black men about after the fifth decade and three times after the, the eighth, eighth decade. And you can see for the other um, ethnic groups and um, so for Hispanic um, the population, for non-Hispanic whites, um, for Asian Americans, you can see that not the same trajectory. So there's a significant prevalence of disease amongst black men. For women, um, you can see that the two um, graphic illustrations here show that there's also increased prevalence for Hispanic women um, as well, specifically about the sixth and seventh decade. Um, but again, for both black and um, black men and black women, prevalence significantly higher, particularly after the fifth decade. Um, when compared to all other groups. What about clinical presentation? So um, lots of people oftentimes say, well, the reason why you see increased prevalence of peripheral vascular disease in black patients is because 
Um, they're more likely to have other risk factors like diabetes and hypertension, more likely to have chronic kidney disease as a result of those two disease states, and then go on to develop um, end-stage renal disease. But we find that even after we adjust for all of these um, clinical risk factors, the prevalence remains. And so there's some other factor at play too uh, for the um, Black American population. Both groups, so both um, Black patients and Hispanic patients here in the United States are significantly less likely to be initiated on statin therapy and to achieve their lipid lowering goals. And, and this is, um, this is a, a huge issue. And I'll talk with you a little bit later about some research that we have um, ongoing at Duke and, and proposals out to help look at some of these issues and help solve them. As I've mentioned, after controlling for CV risk factors, there's still excess morbidity and mortality. And so we're gonna talk about factors maybe at play there. And then though there's higher risk among the Hispanic population for CV equivalent risk factors, um, there's actually um, this terminology called the Hispanic paradox EAD. So even though there's increased risk of hypertension and diabetes, we find that, and, I, and you probably saw this in the, the um, figure with um, PAD prevalence in men, there's not the same prevalence rise in Hispanic males as in black males. And so there's what's called the Hispanic paradox in PAD. We'll talk a little bit about that in, in oncoming slides. So disparities in statin use. So a lot of my research focuses on implementation and how you get um, goal-directed medical therapy to the targeted population. And we know in a very troubling way that compared with non-users, statin use is associated with reduced risk after adjustment, lower extremity amputation for in-hospital death and all-cause mortality. Unfortunately though, we know that black patients and Hispanic patients are significantly less likely to get prescriptions for statins even have a PAD diagnosis in their medical chart, even when they have a CAD diagnosis in their medical chart, and even when they have both. And so they're about 42% less likely to get um, a, a prescription, which is troubling. And this is after adjustment for age, this is after adjustment for hypertension, their baseline um, LDL and their total cholesterol. And so this is a forest plot that I often like to, to show. Um, showing your ASDVD risk greater than seven and a half percent. Blacks are less likely to get statins when they have that, um, when they have diabetes, um, and when they have any indication for a statin benefit. So lots of opportunity to think about how we get statins and other medical therapies to the population that we know is the highest risk for having any mortality as related to PAD. Now, what about disparities in revascularization? So I've told you that I'm located right in this PAD belt that's shown here in the Southeastern United States and, and certainly in, the, in Texas, in some parts of the Northeast. And so you might say, well, um, why, does this, why does this disparate map, why, why does it exist? So certainly we know that some of the risk factors for PAD are more prevalent in some of these areas, or diets, um, other factors at play, potentially some socioeconomic. But I wanna call your attention to the figures on the right. So on the y-axis for each of these figures is the regional amputation rate. So as you go up on the y-axis, the rate increases. On the x-axis is the regional intensity of vascular care. So as you, go, as you go to the right, your intensity of vascular care in that area increases, your access to vascular specialists, vascular surgeons, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see across for inpatient revascularizations, endovascular, surgical, open, outpatient revascularization for all of these figures, as your intensity of vascular availability um, intensity of vascular care in the area increases, so does your amputation rate. And so a lot of health systems, particularly in the PAD belt, have done exactly what Duke has done, which is affiliated hospital in these um, areas of, of PAD um, and trying to get increased access to care, trying to get these patients access to, to PVI, both um, surgical and endovascular. 
This slide is always a little troubling to me um, when I look at it. Um, so this is racial disparities in amputation risk. And so oftentimes it's cited that potentially the amputation risk is high because um, certain populations don't have the same access to care. And so I draw your attention to these two figures. So the one on the left um, shows your odd ratio of amputation risk on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the revascularization volume um, per hospital or the fourth hospital quartile. You have the highest um, revascularization capacity. These are hospitals that are doing high volumes of endovascular and surgical PVI. Um, the first quartile would obviously be the lowest. However, as you notice, for Black patients in your third and fourth quartile hospitals, um, their risk of amputation actually increases. Um, and then you don't see that same trend in overall, and this is predominantly driven by white patients, as you can see in the green bars. So this would be opposite, counterintuitive to potentially what we think as you get higher um, volume hospitals, your tertiary care, you would hope to see amputation risk for these high risk populations to decrease. Now, what about um, by zip code of income um, quartile? So your fourth income quartile shown on the, um, the right figure is the highest. So these are um, wealthy zip codes compared to your first quartile, which are poor zip codes. Again, we see the troubling statistic that your amputation risk um, for, um, for um, Blacks overall goes up in these wealthier quartiles overall for, for white patients, including Black patients, decreases. So, um, so some areas um, that confuse the picture a little bit, something that I hope we can talk about at the end a little bit more, but I think there is certainly a socioeconomic um, issue at play here in addition to risk factors at play um, that make the that make black Americans um, have a more troubling time with getting adequate treatment um, and avoiding amputation. So an area of my particular interest in PAD is patient reported outcomes measures. Um, this is these are common measures that are used already in registries and clinical trials for peripheral vascular disease, as well as many other cardiovascular disease states like heart failure to monitor and, and measure the patient's perception of their disease state. And something I find interesting is, is this result from the CLEVER trial. So the CLEVER trial looked at optical medical care um, versus revascularization um, versus supervised exercise. And it used both the SF12, so the short form 12, which is just a, um, a, a patient reported outcome measure that's used in many different states. It's not disease specific, like the peripheral artery questionnaire that was developed by John Spurtis. And so it looks at a race um, treatment interaction. And you can see that for the SF12, um, for white patients um, and black patients, this is shown on the bottom two figures, um, that uh, for white patients, you can see that, so optimal medical care is this lower line. Um, this upper line is optimal medical um, care plus um, 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 treatment with PVI or um, stenting. And then this middle line is supervised. And so you can see for white patients, um, they benefited from really both um, potentially um, supervised exercise and, and, and undergoing revascularization. Patients, there seem to be more of a trend towards getting benefit from supervised exercise from both the PAQ and the SF12. And this has um, been a trend that's been seen across multiple studies is that there seems to be um, a race interaction with increased benefit for Black Americans um, for supervised exercise. And I'll talk a little bit later about how we have difficulties in a lot of different areas with getting cardiac rehab and supervised exercise programs uh, available for a lot of our patients. It's a real challenge um, to get reimbursement and coverage, and so a lot of patients don't have access to that. But it certainly seems like from studies, such as this one from Clever, that there may be benefits for Black Americans. I'll briefly touch on sex disparities. So 
um, for, for women and men, actually men in general um, have poor outcomes with regard to, to PAD. I think a lot of this is because the prevalence um, is increased in men compared to women. However, I will say that women tend to present at a later stage. Um, men tend to come in at the, the time of having claudication symptoms. Women tend to present when they have already advanced to CLTI, um, may have limb loss, um, tissue loss, um, and, and other um, findings like that. But in the left two figures, um, you see MACE in all-cause mortality. Men are in blue, women in red. You can see that men um, have significantly worse and um, risk of MACE and um, all-cause mortality with the um, diagnosis of PAD. Pretty similar rates of males, so major adverse limb events and post-revascularization um, LER, so needing to go back for repeat revascularization between the groups. Um, but again, uh, men tend to do a little bit worse overall, um, but women tend to present a little bit later. So an area that I think is just fascinating, um, so is, is goal-directed medical therapy prescribing. And there's been a lot of publications around this in the past um, five to seven years. And so I draw your attention to the left figure in the bottom of the screen. Um, this was, was published back in 2020. And this looked at patients, this was out of the um, NCDR registry. This is the patients that were discharged um, after having peripheral vascular intervention. So they obviously have a diagnosis of PAD and they've undergone PVI um, in, in house. And you can see that goal directed medical therapy on admission, 44%, only increases to about 47.5% um, at, at the time of discharge. This is, this is troubling. These are medications like aspirin, potentially Plavix statin therapies, um, potentially ACER or ARBs, and then now more recently, potentially low-dose rivaroxaban. So the patients are not getting, even after PVI, um, the medications they need. And then as I think is often shown, if we look at this um, floor spot here on the, the right side, at the right lower bottom, the patient's less likely to be discharged on aggregate goal-directed medical therapy um, include your sickest patients. So your patients with CLI, the most advanced um, PAD, they tend to um, get uh, less prescriptions for GDMT. Your patients on dialysis, your patients with concomitant CHF, your older patients. And so this is uh, really troubling. Um, we're, we're missing out on opportunities at these medications. To, to the most advanced patients. And, and you know, certainly I recognize that these patients may have other concomitant issues, um, hypotension, low blood pressure, um, issues with frailty, things like that, that may complicate this picture. But I think overall, lots of opportunity. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that this is a publication um, I published back in 2020 in Jack. And this was using data from, from again, the PVI registry, which is now um, uh, closed and gone and collapsed into the STS um, BQI registry. But this was looking at different classes of medications, aspirin, Plavix, or ACEs, or statins, and beta blockers. And as we have often seen, PAD is not recognized in the community as being a risk equivalent to CAD. So we know, and this is borne out over time, that if you give the patient a diagnosis of CAD concomitantly with their PAD, all of a sudden they're likely to get to therapy. But now what if you also look at if they have CLI plus CAD, claudication plus um, CAD, all of a sudden you can see that your CLI patients um, alone, significantly less likely to get these various classes of medications compared to your claudicants. So your sickest patients less likely to get the medications they need. If you add CAD on in each category, more likely to get um, these medications. And so just wanna challenge the group that I think we need to start thinking of PAD the same way we think about our CAD patients. If they have a diagnosis of PD, you should be treating them 
like they potentially have concomitant CAD. There are risk factor equivalents. So overall, um, the current state of PAD care and outcomes um, in the United States and, and our vascular medicine group at Duke has published a lot in this area. So 49% of risk of hospitalization, 15% risk of mortality in two years, 8% risk of limb loss. If you add on other socioeconomic factors like having Medicaid, being black in the United States, all of these risk factors and all of these terrible outcomes that we want to avoid for our patients significantly rise. And so I think there's lots of opportunity here um, over the coming decade to make a lot of these um, morbidity, mortality outcomes and decrease for these populations. And so I'm going to keep moving to my next um, area. And, and one of the things that I'm, I'm very uh, passionate about, because I think some of this drives why we have these disparities. Um, so I think it's certainly at play. So I'll briefly touch on disparities in the vascular workforce um, by talking about a couple of publications that have come out um, um, very recently. So, um, published in 2021 in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, um, looking at women, Hispanic and black um, trainees so currently, or in the contemporary era, women make up at about a third of vascular surgery residents. This has increased um, over time, over about a decade period of time, from 13% to 27%. Um, black trainees, still about 5% of the overall population. And when you look at the relative ratio in specialty versus medical school, so the bottom area of this graphic, you can see that women um, are not going into vascular surgery. So there's a drop off between medical school and going into vascular surgery specialties um, as compared to even um, general surgery. For instance, you can see that there's a significant drop off in the ratio. Um, for black trainees, um, it's a little deceiving because it looks close to a one-to-one -one ratio, but there's such underrepresentation of black uh, medical students that uh, while they do go into vascular surgery at a, um, uh, at a higher rate than women, um, they're vastly underrepresented because they're underrepresented in medical schools. Um, to go on with the underrepresentation of women, um, so this is a graphic um, from Sonia Borges, um, published and this is actually using Australian data, but the proportion of growth of and women in cardiology is about on par here in the United States with Australia. And so you can see that there will not be parity in, in women representation in cardiology and certainly in interventional cardiology, even out to 2070. Um, less than 5% of the overall interventional cardiologists are women in the United States. And and around 15% um, practicing cardiologists. And then just this graphic here, you can see vast underrepresentation um, for interventional cardiologists, certainly a drop off at each stage from general fellowship, to interventional cardiology um, fellowship, um, and then into practice. And this occurs for both women and um, these. And so why is this important? And people often ask me this. Um, so we had a, a significant recruitment initiative at Duke that we published a few years ago that resulted in um, about a 67% increase in representation in our general cardiology fellowship among women and, and underrepresented minorities. Why should we care about this? Um, is there actually any data that shows that, that diversity in your, your faculty or diversity in your fellowship really even matters? And I would say yes. I would say if we want to build the pipeline um, so that we continue to have women interested in the field coming up the pipeline, um, Black trainees interested in the field coming up the pipeline, they need to see mentorship and, and trainees that are successful and have successful mentorship. And there's been increasing data about why this is important, certainly from patients' perception of their hospitalization or their clinic visit. Um, there's significant increase in, in how the, the patient feels about the, the visit when there's racial or ethnic concordance. So I do think particularly in, in PAD and some of the vascular diseases um, where there is some potential mistrust um, with the medical system, it's important to have diversity and specialists in this area. 
And we certainly know that there's increasing um, evidence for um, research groups and work forces and task forces that it's important to have gender heterogeneous working groups. And um, I think a lot of the professional societies have caught on to this and are trying to increase representation because it increase, increases uh, representation of ideas, new thoughts, um, and certainly um, potentially higher quality research. A next topic I think that's a um, significant issue within uh, PAD in the United States is the heterogeneity of PAD treatment patterns. And so what do I mean by this? So we've published a little bit on this as well. I've already um, shown you the geographic variation, lower extremity amputation rates um, in patients with peripheral vascular disease, and, and talked a little bit about how um, this affects certain areas more than others. Another thing I wanna call your attention to is the dramatic change that has occurred in where we do PVI um, and who is treating peripheral vascular patients that has really occurred over the past decade. So something that's always, I think, troubling to me are these um, heterogeneous practice patterns with regard to how we evaluate patients to bring them to the endovascular suite to consider them for amputation. So if you look down here, this is a table looking at um, any in arterial testing and these are underwent amputation. You can see of, of the foot, below the knee, above. Overall, so for all patients, only 68% had some sort of testing prior to amputation. So that means an, an ABI, that means duplex ultrasound, some sort of imaging or going for runoff um, invasive angiography. And that's, that is troubling. This is contemporary data that we are taking patients potentially for amputation without consideration of what their anatomy looks like. Um, our practice um, within Duke, and I know a lot of, of colleagues practice, is to at least have some sort of, if you're not dealing with wet gangrene or something emergent, to have some sort of arterial examination prior to see if there's revascularization options so you can limit the amount of limb loss that occurs and also make your amputation, um, your arterial bed and your, your um, uh, possibilities for healing um, significantly better. And so you can see that Unfortunately, in the right upper um, figure that a lot of these various techniques for examining um, arterial um, testing have not really increased um, all that much. And this is even just talking about an ABI, which is a very easy, att attainable, cheap form of, of looking at um, peripheral vascular disease. It's still being way underutilized. So this is a flow diagram of the assignment of Medicare beneficiaries to PVI categories. And so this was looking at almost four patients um, in the United States. About 18% of them underwent surgical revascularization. Um, about 80% of them underwent peripheral vascular intervention, and that was including atherectomy, stents, angioplasty. And what I want to draw your attention to is the changes that we're seeing um, in where patients are getting um, particularly endovascular um, PVI. So the office space setting back in 2006, um, you can see has significantly increased over time. Patients are getting much more of their procedures done in an office space setting. So this is not the outpatient setting, like they come in to do for an outpatient and um, PVI and then go home potentially the same day in an ops day. This is an office-based lab. Um, same thing with atherectomy. Didn't really see atherectomy occurring in an office-based up until about 2011, 2012 time period. And this had a lot to do with changes in Medicare reimbursement. Now all of a sudden you could get that bundled fee all within the office-based laboratory setting. So a lot of our care has shifted to um, for these patients in office-based labs. And so you may say, well, does that really matter? Um, the outcomes are probably the same. Probably similar um, operators um, doing these procedures in, in inpatient, outpatient settings. And, and now the patient may be able to have a little bit more comfort in an office-based setting. 
So I would say the 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 um the outcomes for all cause mortality hospitalization and my um, major adverse limb amputations do look about the same between um, office and outpatient. Um, are certainly higher for inpatient. That's a sicker patient population if they need to come in for an actual admission typically, um, but similar for those outcomes. But what about repeat revascularization? So they have their peripheral vascular intervention. You hope not to see them back in 30 days. Um, you know that you might see them back in a year, but you definitely hope not to see them back in 30 days. You can see that there's significantly higher risk of 30 repeat revask for office-based procedures compared to outpatient and, and even inpatient. Um, and this holds true for 30 days and one year. So I think there's a bit of concern about um, how these office-based procedures um, may be playing out um, if there could be in some instances, not all, but potentially perverse incentives as a result of reimbursement changes. What about the current state of antithrombotic and antiplatelet usage post PVI? So even with my own institution, um, the various operators have vastly different practices for what we send patients home with um, after PVI. And I often get questions from my fellows saying, what, what's the common strategy? Is it a month? Is it three months? Are we doing DAPT? Are we doing single antiplatelet therapy? Should we be doing now with Voyager, um, Lotus River Roxy? What should we be doing? And so this has also been looked at um, by the group at Duke and, and about 85,000 patients. You can see that about a fifth of all of those patients were not prescribed um, any antibiotic therapy, which is, is concerning. Um, and patients with operators that were radiologists or surgeons had lower odds of PTY12 inhibitor use overall. So the top shows the 80% that were eligible for PTY12 inhibitor use. Um, they weren't on full dose anticoagulation for maybe concomitant AFib. Um, about 40% were on prior P. Hi everyone, thank you for your patience. Let's reconnect Dr. Bornick and Dr. Weimer. Morning, ladies. 
Okay. Well, we seem to have had a little glitch in the matrix, as they say. But what we'll do is we'll have you go off of mute and then start to pick up where you left off there. Perfect. Can you see my slides again? Not yet. What about now? Okay, let me, sorry everyone, and I got it here. All right, here we go, back in business here. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about challenges and future directions in PAD research, and this is the area I'm most excited about. So underrepresentation in contemporary PAD trials, um, I've just spent the past half an hour telling you that the prevalence in black patients is higher than white patients um, and even in non-Hispanic um, or in Hispanic um, women and men. But our most contemporary trials of PAD patients, including COMPASS and Voyager PAD. So I'll just re quickly remind you, COMPASS um, should benefit for both C-patients with low-dose rivaroxaban. Um, Voyager PD, PAD was, um, should benefit of aspirin combined with low-dose low rivaroxaban following um, lower extremity revascularization, so both surgical and endovascular. Um, only one to 2% um, participation for, for Black Americans um, in Black patients overall um, in these, um, these trials. So huge disparity. Um, and obviously, you always worry about um, generalization um, in, in trials like this when you have such a low population of the patients that you're primarily taking care of. So um, a lot of what I'll focus on is how do we increase representation in trials going forward. So this is a schematic, and this is really the way I think about challenges in PAD research um, currently. So um, several of them, there's geographic mismatch. So I just showed you that um, there is um, a PAD belt in the southeast where the amputation rates are um, extremely high. And what I'll show you in a few minutes is the areas for research recruitment um, oh, in those particular areas. So there's mismatch between where the patients are and where our recruitment centers are. Difficulties with recruiting PAD patients into trials. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. There's too many trials, I think, um, or there's been a common focus on, as you may expect, um, medications and devices, less on implementation. We have all of this evidence about what works and what would reduce um, and improve PAD outcomes, but we're not so much focused on how to Im implement the evidence. There's increased need for um, validation evidence um, for patient reported outcomes measures and disparate and this is some of my work that I've been looking at. Um, and then there's very few patient advocacy groups um, in PAD. And then as we've talked about, heterogeneous local practices and fragmentation of care, meaning in California in a particular area, vascular surgeons may be, may be taking care of patients um, with PAD. And in certain areas of the Southeast, it may be more of your primary care physicians, um, cardiologists. So lots of fragmentation of who owns the care. So something I've been looking at, uh, working with a group called Vascular Cures out of California is, is looking at if there's a racial difference in patient reported outcome um, use and perception among um, black patients in particular. So we have various patient reported outcome measures like the PAQ, like the WIQ that are commonly used, um, but the validation work for these outcome measures in PAD um, has really not been validated in, in Black Americans or black, the Black population in general. So we know that Black patients have a much higher prevalence of PAD. Um, they have much more advanced disease on presentation they're significantly more likely to have an amputation after PAD, PVI and to undergo repeat PVI. And there's, but there's only been one prior study that's actually validated or looked at um, evidence about whether these tools actually work the same way, um, have the same sensitivity, have the same responsiveness as compared to white patients. So, Many of these tools uh, were validated in 40 to 50 patients in a predominantly white population of patients. So 
um, interesting to see if they're, they're useful as well in disparate populations. And as I've mentioned here, previous validation studied included less than 10% black patients. So why does it matter? PRMs are already uh, widely being used in registries and clinical trials despite little validation work. So um, you can see in the CLEVER trial in Euclid with PAQ in the short form, portrait, stroll, and erase. Um, for most trials, um, Voyager, Compass included, there's going to be a secondary endpoint that includes a patient reported outcome measure, but we don't have a really good sense of, of how well they're validated in subpopulations of the, of the patient population of CBD. And so you may say, okay, well, these are great at determining patient perceptions of disease in peripheral artery disease, but um, do they really match clinical Endpoints, And so I looked at this using some data from Euclid published in 2020. And I, I said, well, what's the probability of MACE and major adverse limb events? And, and how does that really track with performance of the PAQ and the VAS and the 36? And you can see that across the board. So the probability of the clinical endpoints um, is on the y-axis, increases as you go up the y-axis. The score of the patient reported outcome measures increase or is better um, for the patient as you increase on the y on the x-axis. You can see across the board your probability of these clinical um, endpoints is, is increased, um, or I'm sorry, is reduced as you, you have an increased score on these patient reported outcome measures. And this has been Born out across um, various disease states, but I think um, these specific tools we've looked at the PAQ, the short form, some with the WIQ tracks well with hard clinical outcomes that we care a lot about, like Mason Malm. So, right now I'm using some funding from um, Vascular Cures and then Women as One organization to validate um, the most common. Um, patient reported outcomes measures in PED amongst the, the black population and Hispanic population. And so it'll look at three different um, study time periods, the baseline period, the, um, the time of revascularization to look at sensitivity. And then the responsiveness factor, we'll look at again, these tools six weeks after uh, revascularization occurs to see if the patient's perception of their disease state, which we hope would improve after P PVI, is actually measured successfully by these tools. So other issues I think currently, as I've mentioned, challenges in recruiting diverse trials. Certainly we've talked a little bit about geographic mismatch between traditional recruitment sites and the target population, a distrust of the medical system, um, as a vascular or as an interventional cardiologist who do, does vascular procedures, I can tell you I act a lot like the, the PC, PCP for these patients. I not only care about whether I open their SFA, but if their diabetes is well controlled and if they're, they're stopping smoking um, and if their kidney disease, if they need to go see a nephrologist to think about dialysis. And, and so a lot of taking care of these patients is developing rapport and a relationship with them. And hopefully with that relationship comes a trust and, and a willingness to think about um, research opportunities. Um, there's difficulties targeting diverse populations for trial enrollment because of the widely uh, differing local practices. So if I'm a cardiologist running a trial, um, I'm gonna probably predominantly include colleagues, other cardiologists, other interventional cardiologists, and I may not be including all of the, all of the subspecialists that take care of these patients in different um, areas of the country. So lots of opportunities to improve how we do research from that perspective, and then a need for community engagement and awareness. So I love this graphic. This was published um, by uh, Dr. Califf is one of the co-authors back in 2014 in, in circulation, and you can see on the right um, where the amputation belt is, but you can see on the left where our recruitment centers um, for PAD and PVI trials um, exist. So the dark circles, the big circles are where the high volume centers are for, for trial 
um, recruitment in, in large tertiary care centers. And you can see some of the opacity of these centers in the Southeast and in areas of high amputation risk. And so there's a bit of um, geographic mismatch. And so we have to think about, are there unique ways? Is, is really the model going forward to only recruit these patients out of your traditional academic medical centers? Or is it more to start thinking about how you can meet the patient where they live, where they exist, in their community, at their churches, at their community centers? Um, and, so, and so how do you accomplish that? Can we think about research recruitment um, more remotely than we currently are? Um, this was a publication in vascular medicine in 2016 that looked at methods of recruitment, particularly of Black Americans in a PAD trial. And so what they did was they sent out various methods of recruitment, so mailings, TV advertisements, community events, and then they called patients um, around Wichita and Kansas City areas. And they said, well, how did you hear about the study? How do you remember hearing about it in this community? 34% remembered from direct mailings, 24% from television and 14% from community. Um, the one thing I wanna draw your attention to in an era of um, limited resources, community events are very cheap um, for patients. Television flyers, obviously much more expensive. And so I think um, as we think about ways to reach a lot of these patients, I do think it's in community centers, in churches, um, in, in places where they convene on a, a weekly or a monthly basis. So one of the studies that we're currently working on at Duke right now is how do we screen patients in the community more effectively? If there's an access to care issue, how do we meet them? And so several of the pharmaceutical companies now have um, PVI or ABI trucks rather um, for use. And so we have put in a research proposal locally um, to go to community centers and historically black churches and screen patients um, after church um, with ABIs to try to increase access of these patients then to the local health system. And I think that this would then translate to potentially um, using these centers as potential uh, research recruitment areas. Also um, wanna talk a little bit about diversification of PAD trials. So I've, I've mentioned a little bit that we have lots of um, PAD device trials and drug trials. We have lots of evidence about what works, you know, statin therapies, lipid lowering therapies, um, we have evidence about um, when to do revascularization in certain patients. Um, we have evidence about um, low-dose rivaroxaban coming down the pipeline, hopefully um, being added to our guidelines soon. Um, but what about implementation studies? If the problem is not necessarily knowing what to do, but how to implement it, I think there needs to be an increased focus on this, increase funding for opportunities about how to um, promote implementation, um, both in the clinic, um, get patients to take their medicines, get providers to realize when the patients need to be prescribed the medications, I think is the first step. And how do we go about um, doing a little bit more implementation work in the PAD space? Um, so a, a little bit of work we're doing at Duke currently. Um, so we're, we're asking um, certain implementation questions. This is called the treat to target PAD um, study. This is looking at symptomatic PAD patients and just asking a simple question, what's the LDL target for these patients? I don't think we know that yet. Um, we don't have equity on whether we should be treating to a low target, LDL less than 70, or to an LDL of, a, of around 100. And so we're looking at that um, within the symptomatic PAD population and trying to um, primary composite endpoints of mates and male to try to figure out um, what we should be doing in the clinic space. And then an area of my focus is, is barriers to goal-directed medical therapy use in PAD. And so there's lots of barriers in this population, but how do I first um, increase the provider prescribing these medications? And then how do I create um, real-time tools in the clinic that the provider can then use to assess what the barriers are and then to challenge those barriers in the clinic space. Um, there's limited amount of time in, in the clinic. So how do I build in 
tools within the electronic health record um, to help the provider talk with the patient about why they're not taking their medications, give them real-time sure script um, prescription fill data so that they know. We, we oftentimes know that patients say they're taking it and they're really not, um, if they are or not, and then have an opportunity for a conversation. So in conclusion, and I'll wrap up, so we have a few minutes of conversation here at the end. Significant disparities were the management of patients um, with PAD, particularly within certain groups like Black Americans. Um, disparities extend to the workforce and may impact the care of patients with PAD. Um, we know that significant variations exist across the United States and even within local practice settings about where we perform procedures, what type of antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapy we give patients um, after PVI. Um, and as I've mentioned, I think there's opportunities to increase our implementation focus um, and to increase um, research engagement, thinking about um, engaging patients at the site of where they live and work on a daily basis rather than having them come to large um, academic medical centers, which I think is really a, a model, um, particularly of the past. So I'll stop there. See if you have any questions and I've um, put my email address at the bottom of the screen. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Reimer, for that comprehensive discussion. Can we ask questions, Dr. Borden? Yes, I'm, I'm calling on you. Dr. Bob Manuel, please uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. Yes, uh, thank you so much. I don't know if you can see me, Dr. Reimer. I can, I can. Hi. My name is uh, Emmy Bob Manuel. I'm one of the interventional fellows here, and um, mm -hmm. thank you for the great talk. I actually trained at Ashner in uh, mm -hmm. New Orleans, Louisiana, so yeah. I'm a real son of the South. And before then, I was at University of Tennessee in Memphis. Oh, I'm actually awesome. going back to Memphis to practice. Um, um, you know, joining a big practice there. So in the Southeast, uh, my passion is PAD, and you know, I did a bunch of vascular stuff before I came up here for interventional cardiology. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed your talk, and I thank you for taking the time to address this big issue in the you know in the vascular space. My question, the first one is a comment. Uh, I know you've heard about the Amputation Reduction and Compassion Act, which mm -hmm. is going through Congress. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Felicia Fakorede, who is actually down in uh, Cleveland, Mississippi, um, in the Mississippi Delta. I mean, if you think you guys are um, if you think you guys are struggling in North Carolina, you should <laughs> see what's going on in Mississippi Delta. Yeah. And, um, you know, just a comment about over 50% of patients who undergo amputations, especially African-Americans, don't even get an angiogram. Yep. They don't even get a duplex ultrasound. Yep. So, you know, and that segues me into my question. You know, while we wait for Congress to do what Congress does on the Amputation Reduction and Compassion Act, because it's still in reading, it's not been passed yet, how can we incentivize people at the podiatry, primary care level? I know we need to educate them, but incentivize is also important. Mm -hmm. And I know that if that law passes, HHS will reimburse and will it, it will make sense money-wise. You know, I know we are training more minorities, we are training, mm -hmm. we are getting, you know, everything we are doing is almost in the pipeline, but people's legs are getting cut off right now. Yeah. So in the present, how can we incentivize, you know, podiatrists, nurse practitioners, uh, primary care, because that's the real people that see this. I mean, I can only see X number of patients, but how can we incentivize them to actually do the duplex ultrasound or think about it when someone has a wound, okay, yeah. maybe I should get an ultrasound, maybe I should refer, because you know, people don't even make it to me. You yeah. know, people don't even make it to me. So what, what are your thoughts? And I know you go to yeah. um, out, outlying counties. Yeah. So how, yeah. do you, how do you navigate that issue? Thank you. Thank you, that's, that's a phenomenal question. Um, and I have to say that's a, that's a complex question and we deal with it. Um, and, and so I'll tell you how we deal with it now and I'll tell you how I think ultimately it will have to be dealt with. So right now I spend quite a bit of time. Um, I, I go out with family medicine practices. Um, I give talks in the community pretty much monthly, um, not in Durham County, not in Wake County. That's not where we need necessarily talks. It's in Vance and Granville and the outlying communities to go out and say, even if you don't have access to these ultrasounds, even if you don't feel comfortable doing the ABI, just send them, just send them over. Here's, here's where you send them. 
just what's the referral um, process? How do you get them over quickly and seamlessly? Once you give them that sort of access, they send the patients, patients get what they need. You show them what the wounds look like. Even if it's venous ulcers and it doesn't, which I see a ton of, they'll send venous ulcers. They still come to me and I have the opportunity to potentially change practice at that point. So A, it, it has to be a community effort um, overall. And, and that's not an easy thing to do on a wide scale. I think more than that, there has to be some metrics around it and metrics around how we're judged. And I think that that's where things get a little trickier. But um, in the myocardial infarction space and the CAD space, when we started putting metrics around your percentage of prescriptions of certain um, goal-directed medical therapy, your performance of certain procedures, that's when things got a lot better. Um, our rates certainly went up when people were being judged on their performance in those, in those particular metrics. And I think to some degree that that has to start um, now. Now that's harder to achieve necessarily because in the vascular space, it's not just one subspecialty taking care of these patients. And so that's where I think it ultimately comes down to a community effort. It's going to take your large tertiary care centers understanding that it makes sense from a business perspective to go out to these affiliated networks and focus on this patient population. My PAD population doesn't exist in Durham. It exists in outlying counties. And so I bring those that that volume back to Duke ultimately. But at the same time, I'm doing a lot of um, aid and assistance to those practices to say, here's what you need to be looking at. These people are literally dying because once we know, once they get amped, their risk of death in two years is sky high. So I think it's a lot of practice. At some point, it'll also have to be metrics and how we're, we're sort of reporting outcomes of various providers um, in a more open space. I'd like to add, uh, ask another question here mm -hmm. uh, re relative to access. And it's a two part question. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about office based labs for a moment mm -hmm. uh, because that's really blossoming. And it's blossoming in areas that might be outside of these big centers like we talked about. How important is an office-based lab for access? How important is it for research? And is repeat revascularization really a problem or does it represent increased follow-up and more aggressive treatment? And could that be a positive thing? Question. That's, that's a really good question. So, you know, I think it's, it's tough. I think the office-based labs um, in some ways could provide increased access for a lot of these patients. Um, I do worry, uh, these patients are not um, oftentimes your patients that are medically non-complex. Um, I don't take care of many peripheral vascular disease patients that just have peripheral vascular disease. And so I worry a little bit when there's increasing and blossoming practices around increasing reimbursements that um, these medically complex patients are being um, taken care of in, in areas that may not be able to serve those medically complex needs. Um, but I will say, I think the access and for the right patient can be very beneficial. With regard to repeat PVI, certainly I think for a certain population of patients may be indicative of aggressive care, of aggressive management. But I do think for a significant population of the repeat PVI, it may represent failure of that initial PVI. I don't think it necessarily just represents, hey, I brought the, the patient back for the contralateral leg, which I also knew had disease from runoff at the, the initial time of doing the initial PVI and I brought them back for the other leg. I, I think it could also represent, and the data has shown, um, some failure of that initial PVI um, or potentially practices to try to um, do additional procedures on patients that may or may not be warranted. Do we know anything about outcomes relative to the office-based labs? Is that data available? Yeah, so um, the outcomes overall, um, so, so for um, things like MACE and, and MI, stroke, things like that, 
are about on par with, with outpatient settings, but really what, what we know is, is worsened is, is risk of repeat revascularization. Um, so obviously I think there's a need to, to dig further into that and find out what those repeat revascularization procedures actually represented um, to really understand that, that issue a little bit better. I'm just gonna encourage people to raise their hand if they have a question, because I, I have maybe one last question myself. Which I, have is, a, I have a question, Dr. You have Brown. a question? Okay, go ahead. Introduce yourself, please. Hey, I'm, I'm Jesse, I'm one of the uh, interventional fellows um, here with, with Emmy. Um, so, you know, I, I really appreciate your talk and I, I think it's extremely important to understand that there's disparities in patients that we see and that's that seems kind of self-evident especially mm -hmm. in our practice environments but it's not always kind of shown to us statistically mm -hmm. um but what what occurs to me is you know we're kind of limited in a lot of ways in our skill set you know we're trained as researchers and clinicians and especially at at the uh, endovascular peripheral level or interventional level we're really trained to do specific procedures but the problem here, as you're pointing out, is much more systemic mm -hmm. and there's a lot of cultural, historical and geographical influences that we don't have the skill sets to address. Mm -hmm. And so my, my question is, I guess, if you're assembling a team that is going to address these issues, we're going to need people that have knowledge and skill sets far beyond what we're capable of. And who do you consult with? Is it lawyers? Is it um, you know, social workers? Is it advertisers or, or community outreach specialists? Who, who should we be involving in or including in this discussion who's not on this call or not in this, mm -hmm. these meetings yep. um, to make an impact? I think that's, that's a really insightful question. So I think it's, not only, like you mentioned, it's not physicians because we're not fully equipped. I mean, we can obviously handle the clinical aspects of, of the patient care, um, somewhat the research aspects of the patient care, but it's, it's really a community effort. And so that's where I found a lot of benefit in working with these, um, these community leaders um, within Durham and Wake County um, and these community centers and historically black churches, because these are the people that are looked up to by the community as leaders. These are the people that um, are trusted, respected. And I think ultimately you have to engage those people if you want to get buy-in from your target population. Um, I think it also involves us not just um, thinking about the patient as a procedure, but working with wound care, working with um, primary care, working with, with government agencies. I think, I know the NIH is very interested in, in research like this, looking at how to increase um, patient engagement into, and specifically engagement of, of black patients into clinical trials. So I think it's a big community and I, I don't think it's an easy thing to solve, but I think where it has to start is within the community and thinking, like I said, about research and about access to care is not just occurring in the hospital, but occurring in centers um, in the patient's community. I'm just gonna Thank add you. one thing about the societies here. We didn't really mm -hmm. talk about the societies or their role, but uh, there seems to be work to be done across cardiology, interventional cardiology, probably vascular surgery, mm -hmm. and maybe other specialty societies and those kind of cross collaborations could be very impactful. Yeah. We've seen that in the structural art world. And part of that is the mandate that you put a CT surgeon together with an interventional cardiologist, but one could envision a mandate for a vascular surgeon and a cardiologist and interventional mm -hmm. cardiologist to work together. Yeah. And that might then uh, bring us closer to some of the goals of the goal-directed medical therapy and getting think, those numbers improved. I think that's a great point. So what I see commonly, and this is, I think, various centers around the country, is that these there, there's this concept of the heart team approach. Certainly, if we're thinking about a really complex PCI in a patient that is on the fence of cabbage versus um, PCI, we, we have a, a brief 
either informal or formal heart um, center conference or conversation. The same thing doesn't necessarily occur. Um, it's either sort of vascular surgery owns it, interventional cardiology owns it, vascular medicine owns the patient. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there where the two groups could work together and the surgical societies could work with the cardiology societies. Um, as I mentioned, there's really very little patient advocacy groups in this area. There's really only one major one in the United States. And so without that advocacy and without the groups working together, I think sometimes we work against ourselves a bit in, in helping these patients. Well, I wanna thank you again for joining us today, Dr. Reimer from Duke University. Mm -hmm. This session will be available for YouTube viewing all over the world. Thank you for joining us for another successful session of our At Monty Heart webinar and featuring this really important topic and giving us something to think about about how we can do better for our patients.